In this video, we're going to explore Stirling's formula, which is this crazy relationship between factorials and, well, n divided by e to the power of n square root of 2 pi n, a mouthful. And it's almost unbelievable that a formula like this could exist, because when I think about factorials, like say 5 factorial is, you know, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, in other words 120, it's this very discrete thing, because you're inputting natural numbers like 5 and you get outputs like 5 factorial is 120. But in the right hand side of this, you've got e's, you've got square roots, you've got pi's floating around. You're like, hold on, why is there a pi there? What's, what's the circle in this scenario? And so it's somewhat surprising that this really works to be such an effective approximation. And to be clear, by approximation, what I really mean is that in the limit as the n gets large, the ratio of these two things is just 1. To get at least some visual intuition about how nicely these two expressions are going to be matched, I'm going to plot them. So on the left hand side here, I'm going to plot in green the continuous function that allows any value of n an integer or not, and you can see in green the expression. But then the blue dots are given here by this table which plots just n factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, and so on. And I mean, look how great this is. For a only slightly large value like 8, the, the numbers are getting really large. For example, factorial is already over 40,000 here, but it looks visually pretty good. And what I'll actually do here is I'm going to zoom in just vertically so that we can start to see what happens with the other points. And even though I'm now making my numbers a lot smaller, right, I'm, I'm now only looking at like n up to 5, again, the match is really good. Normally, limits like this are, are valid only when you send n to be really large. But even for small values, it's actually a really good approximation. This software where I'm making this document and doing this plotting, by the way, is called Maple Learn, and they are the sponsor of today's video. Uh, more about them a little bit later. So what's going on here? Well, in this video, I'm going to show you three ingredients that are going to get mixed together to result in this Sterling formula. So let me show you those three ingredients first, because they're all kind of interesting little pieces of mathematics. And the first ingredient is called the gamma function. The gamma function is, well, defined to be, gamma of n plus 1 is defined to be some crazy improper integral. The integral from 0 to infinity of x to the n, e to the minus x dx. And what's really nice about this gamma function is that if n is a natural number, then the output of this integral is just n factorial. The basic proof of this comes from integration by parts, and I had to use the gamma function in a previous video in Laplace transforms, so I'll link the video for the full proof that this indeed is true. But nevertheless, the gamma function is this really nice way to represent factorial, and it's how I'm going to represent factorial specifically in this video. Okay, so that's the first ingredient. Second ingredient I need to tell you about, well, that is going to be the Taylor approximation, the triumph of first year calculus, or at least the series part of first year calculus. And the idea is this. If you have some function f of x, and you want to come up with an approximation for it, well, the quadratic approximation is this, and you can get a better approximation with a higher number of terms. But the first three are these, and basically what you have is a constant term. You're saying, I'm going to approximate it at a point x naught. It's just going to be the function at x naught. Secondly, you get a linear term, which its coefficient is given by the derivative, and finally a quadratic term, an x minus x naught squared, and its coefficient is the second derivative divided by 2. And the point of Taylor approximation was, okay, let's imagine we had a curve like e to the x, and I wanted to approximate what e to the x was around the origin, around the point x equal to 0, where we know that e to the 0 was just the height 1. Well, if I just looked at the constant term in the Taylor approximation, I'd say, okay, I could approximate e to the x with just y equal to 1. That would just be the constant term. And it's not a bad approximation right there at x equal to 0, but quickly is terrible elsewhere. Then the whole idea of the derivative is instead to replace this with the slope of a tangent line. And the slope of the tangent line is also going to meet at the point x equal to 0, but it's a better approximation for longer. And then finally, if I add that third term, the so-called second order term, instead I'm going to make this a quadratic, which is going to be 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2. And you can sort of visually see here how this parabola is a better approximation to e to the x than just the constant or just the linear ones. 
So we're gonna use this Taylor approximation as part of our approach to get to Stirling's approximation. That is the second ingredient. Third ingredient, and this is always a fun one, this is the Gaussian integral. It's an integral from minus infinity all the way up to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx, and it's just equal to root pi. This is an incredibly important integral in probability theory, and actually I have done a whole video talking about the Gaussian integral, so you can check out exactly how I evaluated this and how that square root pi was going to come in in my previous video. Okay, so those are my three ingredients, the gamma function, the Taylor series, and the Gaussian integral. Now it's time to actually get to Stirling's formula. So, where are we? This is how we're going to begin with n factorial being just the gamma function. So I've written n factorial as an integral. Now I need to do a little bit of manipulation on this integral, so bear with me. I'm going to do first a quick change of variables. I'm going to make x equal to n times z. So that means that anywhere in this integral where there's an x, I'm going to replace it with an n times z. So I have just a little bit of a conversion. I see that there's an n to the n and one more n's in my integrand. I'm going to pull them all out and just get n to the n plus 1. That just cleans that up a little bit. Then if I focus on that z to the n, I'm going to do a very standard little trick that's nice here. z to the n, I want to make it compatible with my exponential. So I can write it as e to the n the logarithm of z. By log rules, your n would go up to the exponent and e to the logarithm of z is just z. So either way, this is the exact same expression. So I'm just doing a little bit of algebraic manipulations right now before we can use one of our actual tools. I now see I have two exponentials and I can mash those two exponentials together. This is going to give me e to the n times the logarithm of z minus z. And this is where I now want to pause and do a bit of analysis. I want to think about this logarithm of z minus z function very carefully. So I'm going to go back to my maple learn document and I'm going to make a new entry here and let's study logarithm of x minus x. And this is what we get. We see a function that has a couple important properties to note for our computation. Number one, this function is always negative. It's always beneath the x-axis. Second point here, well, it goes negative really quickly. The largest value of it occurs right around here. And if I want to see exactly what it is, I can come along and click show special points. And it will tell me that indeed, this maximum occurs at the value of x equal to 1. So takeaways, this function is always negative, but its largest value is at z equal to 1. Okay, so now let's take that logarithm of z minus z function, and let's apply a Taylor series to it. So we have our Taylor series up one more time, and I need to figure out the function, its derivative, and its second derivative. I can do those computations. The first function, of course, is the logarithm of z minus z. I take its first derivative, and I take its second derivative, and I get these two expressions. Then I'm going to do this Taylor expansion at the maximum that we just saw from the graph, at the value of z equal to 1. So I plug 1 in everywhere, and I get these three values, minus 1, 0, and minus 1. So now I can write out the second order Taylor approximation. It's that logarithm of z minus z about the maximum value of z equal to 1 is minus 1 plus minus 1 half z minus 1 squared. We've been doing a bit of manipulation on the side, so where exactly was I? I was at this spot previously. I had taken my n factorial, I've written it as an integral, I did some algebraic manipulations, and I'll pop this logarithm of z minus z, which I've now gone and studied. So what I'm going to do here, and I owe you some justification in a moment, is I'm going to replace the logarithm of z minus z with its Taylor series. I'm going to say that this is just the same thing, now it's approximately opposed to equal, but e to the n, and then I put that second order Taylor series. I can clean this up a little bit. For example, I notice that I have an e to the minus n. Let's just take that entirely out of the integral, and so that just gets cleaned up. And now what I'm going to focus on is the integrand e to the minus n over 2 z minus 1 squared. Now, to make the justification that it was reasonable to plug in the Taylor series at that maximum, I really need to think about what this integrand is saying to see whether this is actually allowed. But this we should recognize because it's somewhat analogous to the form of the Gaussian integral I mentioned before. Now, there's a few differences between here. The first, perhaps, is that it's an integral from minus infinity up to infinity. I'll tell you in a moment why that's not going to matter. And then there's a constant, the, the n over 2, that doesn't appear. And there's a shift at z minus 1 and not just z. But both of those can be adapted with just a change of variables. Now, I need to understand one core geometric property of these Gaussians. 
So what I want to imagine is I've, I know that they have this coefficient n, so I'm going to define n to be some slider. I'll set it to go between 1 and, say, 100, but we can imagine that it's going to be going between 1 and, you know, as n goes to infinity here. And then I will use that to plot the Gaussian e to the minus n times, how about x minus 1 squared. And this is what it looks like. It looks like a bell curve, one of the primary purposes why we might be interested in the Gaussian. But because it has this parameter n here, watch what happens when I take n and I increase it. The bigger the value of n, it's kind of like the, the shape of this curve gets squished more and more. So when I go to n equal to 1 here, it's a thick Gaussian, and as my n increases, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And the key takeaway that we're about to use is that when you have a large value of n, remember, we're taking n to infinity, that this Gaussian is just effectively zero everywhere except a narrow region around the center, in our case, the center being this point x equal to 1. The point here about why this justification is reasonable is that when I have a large value of n, because that's what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be taking the limit as n goes to infinity. When I take a large value of n, what the e to the minus n times this does is it just looks like this very narrow region that's zero pretty much everywhere else. And recall that we did this Taylor expansion around z equal to 1, which was the maximum of logarithm of z minus z. If you had chosen to expand around some other point, the scenario would be even worse. You'd have e to an even more negative of a number, and the collapsing away from this approximation point would go down to zero even faster. Now, I, I acknowledge I'm being a little bit hand-wavy here and saying, okay, it's going to go down to zero very quickly, it's not going to matter. There is a formal proof that needs to be done. This is called Laplace's method, and for a generic category of such f, which logarithm of z minus z satisfies, this will always work out. But I'll put a link down in the description so you can see the larger proof of this method if you're so interested. Regardless, what I've tried to argue is that a Taylor approximation, which is only valid around the point, is reasonable to do because away from that point it's dropping off to zero and it's not going to matter to the integral anyways. The Gaussian integral was going to give you value of root pi, but because there is an n over 2 on the top, it becomes root pi 2 divided by n instead. I'm going to put the n to the n and the e to the minus n together. I'm going to factor out the one extra n, and I get my final version with a little bit of algebra stated the way Stirling's formula is. And so we finally have it. n factorial is approximately equal to n divided by e to the power of n square root of 2 pi n. We're done. My thanks once again to MapleSoft for sponsoring this video. I definitely encourage you to check out either Maple Calculator on the App Store or the Play Store, which, at least in my opinion, is the best and most powerful free calculator app, or Maple Learn for the browser, which allows you to make these wonderful mathematics documents where they do the computations for you, they do the graphics for you. It's really cool. So check out those Maple products. Other than that, if you have any questions about this video, leave them down in the comments below, and we'll do some more math in the next video.